Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rindell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello and welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast from Diffuse. Welcome back to our regular listeners and a very happy new year to everyone. For our first podcast this year, 2023, I'm delighted to introduce my friend and today's guest, Alsa Anderson. Alsa was the communication and press secretary to her late Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II from 2001 to 2013. A former newspaper journalist, Alsa moved into the public relations and worked as a press officer for the British government. During her time in the royal household, she worked on two jubilees, the wedding of the current Prince and Princess of Wales, and the birth of Prince George. She was awarded the Royal Victorian Order in 2011 for her services to the royal household. She is now a royal commentator for the US broadcaster ABC News and reports extensively during the death and the funeral of Her Majesty the Queen. Welcome. Very good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real honour and privilege to be talking to you today. <coughs> now, if I cough, I, I must apologise. I've had a dreadful cold all over Christmas, so um, and hopefully you'll do most of the talking, so that's why. <coughs> so, I mean, welcome. I mean, I've, I've known you for a while. Your, um, your bio kind of undersells you, which is, which is always a good thing. <coughs> Excuse me. But let's start off with, I mean, what is it? What, what, do you, what do you do? What is a communications director? That's a really, really good question. So when I was a journalist, everybody hated comms directors because they always thought you were being sold something, you know, sold a bit of fluff. Um, so journalists and comms directors always had sort of almost an, an, an uneasy truce when it, sort of planting a story. But I suppose a comms director is someone who is a, an advisor on all communications, whether it's internal, external, um, a, a maybe a bit of a mother superior, you know, maybe a bit of a shrink. You hear people's problems. Uh, someone who will be absolutely, totally honest with their principal, because what I've found in my own experience, what a principal doesn't <coughs> need is someone who is a yes person. You know, and it takes, it does take courage and backbone to stand up to someone, especially if they're strong willed and have got very strong opinions about certain issues. But you wouldn't be doing your job properly if you didn't offer the advice that you thought was best for them. And, you know, and the consequences if they went through a, a different route to the one you advised. So I think <coughs> comms person has got many, many facets. Um, uh, as I said, probably wife, mother, ma mother superior. Um, and professional, professional spokesperson. Now, mind, mindful of your previous time in government, I have to ask a question about, you know, the term spin doctor seemed to evolve out of that period of time. I mean, yeah. that, that can't be something that was, is something that sits comfortably because spin imp implies, I suppose, mistruths or, or, or changing the story. Well, I would actually, I would challenge that narrative. I would say a spin doctor is someone who puts the best light onto a, a policy or you know, a new set of regulations. So spin, yeah, spin maybe got awkward connotations, but I would say much more you're presenting a new policy in the best possible light, which makes it um, palatable for the public and easily understandable. So I maybe I, I yeah, I would challenge that. So, so is 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 spin, if you like, you know, in in the positive way, is that part of being a comms director then? Yeah, I mean, if you've got if you've got a policy which you're presented with, um, of course you're going to try and sell it. You know, you're, everyone in comms tries to sell something, whether you're working for you know a, a national airline to a big supermarket. You know, you you've got a you've got a brand if you like, to, to sell. That's gov true of government, that's true of the royal household, that's true of the Church of England. You know, it, as much as they probably hate the word brand, it is a brand. Um, and you've got to present that brand in the best possible light. And, and so, when things go, you know, uh, tits up, as I, sorry, colloquially use, then you've got to try and you know, dig yourself out of that hole and try and spin it uh, in, a, in a more palatable way. 
So is there a difference between a comms director and a PR person? Yeah, that's a good, really good question, Philip. I suppose there, there is. A PR person is someone who is selling something all the time. A comms director sometimes has to know when not to sell something or when not to rebut or when you're facing a reputational or crisis issue, what you're doing. But so you're not always selling. Sometimes it's, it's when you're not selling where you really, really have to bring all your professional skills to the fore. And, and is it... I mean, you were an ex-journalist. Is is that yeah. a traditional routine, or, or can you come in from other routes? Um, I mean, that's a really good question. When I joined the Royal Household, um, the, the people in the press office came from basically very traditional backgrounds. So no one were ex-PR, no one were ex-journalists, um, but they wanted to start professionalising the whole Royal Household. So they started bringing in people with different qualities and different strengths and, and different backgrounds. So um, I was brought in with a fellow colleague who used to work for Seven Trent Water Company. I would, I'd come as chief press officer from the cabinet office. So we came in and brought different, more maybe more current skills to that organisation. And were, when you go from government to the royal household, you know, different subjects, but is it the same role? Is it the same kind of issues you're dealing with or the same? <laughs> Necessarily. No, again, a very good question. So obviously, when you're working in government, you're dealing with policy. So you're promoting a policy. Um, the royal household, the monarch, doesn't set policies. So a lot more of what you're concentrating on is a family and an institution which needs to be relevant, which needs to be value for money, um, which needs to support the causes that it represents, and to... Uh, show its own self-worth, I suppose. So, no, very, very different. I mean, the first year I was there, um, the amount of faux pas I must have made through addressing people with the wrong titles or standing in the wrong place yeah, was, was second to none. Um, I'm surprised I survived 13 years, to be honest. And so who, I mean, do you, do you work, or did you work then, kind of directly to the Queen? Were you kind of briefed by you're, her, you're or how, how does it work? Set. Yeah, you're part of the private secretary's office. So, yes, absolutely, you work directly with the Queen and other members of the royal family as well. Um, but the majority of work with the Queen, you, you, you work through the private, the private office, the private secretary. But, of course, the Queen undertook many engagements every year. So you go out and do either the domestic engagements or the overseas engagements as well. And she hosted lunches, many, many receptions. So you would see the Queen on a, on a pretty frequent basis. And I, I still feel it. I still always, even after 13 years, used to walk across the forecourt at Buckingham Palace and there would still be a buzz. Yeah. Every time I would just think what an incredible honour and privilege it is, you yeah. know, to probably walk into one of the most iconic buildings in the land. Yeah. Every yeah. day. It really was a privilege. Yeah. I mean, I, I can I can understand that. I, I uh, stood outside it a few times on guard. So uh, and it was always I always felt a sense of history, even just by doing I that. I bet. Yeah. I mean, I have to ask you, obviously, the Queen died very recently. What, what's your abiding memory? I, I, know, I know you work for the US uh, press around this, but what's your memory of her? How would you remember her? I obviously I know people say it before, but it's her incredible sense of duty. Um, what I loved about the Queen is even after 70 years on the throne, she would go on an engagement and she would come back and she would find something new or interesting to talk about following that engagement. So she, goodness knows how many trips to you know, schools or museums or libraries or you know, ships, but she would always come back and she'd say, did you hear that, that young lad talk about something? Or wasn't that an interesting comment about the economy that the professor made from the LSE? So there was yeah, her, her sense of of still finding pleasure in those engagements, um, her sense of ridiculous. So the Queen loved nothing more than going on an engagement and there'd be some sort of cock up. So you know, the, she would do a, a, a plaque unveiling and the, and the curtain would fall down or someone would forget their words or you know, just something ridiculous that would make her smile because everyone, as you know, rehearses these visits so many times to get them completely you know, correct. So if something went wrong, you know, how hysterical was that? Yeah. Um, I also think the Queen's incredible sense of, of generosity, surprising generosity. And I, again, I remember working on um, 
President Obama or Mrs. Obama's state visit to the UK. Uh, and they had their official ceremony in horse guards, probably something you've seen many times before. And then there's always an official lunch at Buckingham Palace for their entourage and the Queen's senior advisor. So probably a lunch of about 30 people. And there's a pre-lunch reception. Uh, and then you go into lunch. So I was standing there chatting to a, another member of the household. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see the Queen walking over with President Obama. I thought she must be on her way to talk to someone important. And she came right up to me and said, Press Secretary, this is President Obama. Mr. President, her husband's in the Royal Navy. And all I could, like a think bubble coming out of my head, thinking, oh my golly, I'm like, the Queen is introducing me to President Obama. It's President Obama, it's the Queen, it's the Queen. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that, I immediately obviously rang my, my husband and, and told him, I said, oh my God, President Obama just said how wonderful the Royal Navy is because the Queen's introduced me to him. I, you know, she didn't have to. And I just thought that was a, a, a huge act of kindness and a story that will stay with me you know, until my dying days. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? How everyone who's ever met the Queen and, and other members, the senior members of the royal family, always has a little story to take away because they were so met that they were, although they've been in all of our lives in the UK for all, all of our, since we've all been born, but, you know, they, they still carry such significance to many people not everyone you know and, and that's that's obviously um something they recognized but when you did meet them whoever you were and whatever your views were there was something very personal about them very and magnetic you know when this queen talked to you you would think you were the most important person in the room you know like a you know a, i know a, a lighthouse beacon was shining on you um and you're right and people will go away always with some sort of special memory and a special experience yeah so let's move back to kind of your role then, because I, I think that's a lovely uh, tribute to the, the Queen. We always, you know, watch the news and, and um, we hear about these these royal sources all the time, don't we? And, and um, I always sit here and say to my wife, "That's utter rubbish. They're just making that up." You know, no one's ever told, <laughs> no one's ever said that. They're just they're just making stuff up and using the word "source" as a a caveat for you know journalistic nonsense, whatever you. But you know, how did that relationship work then between the comms team and the media in terms of making sure that the right bits got out and countering maybe stories I didn't want to hear or untruths and what have you? How does that yeah. work? Again, well, a royal source, of course, can be anyone. It could be a member of the royal family themselves. It could be a member of staff. It could be the police, um, a footman, someone who'd been to a reception, a friend of a member of the royal family. I mean, a source is such a broad term. It could be it could be anyone. Um, obviously, anything a spokesperson for the Queen or the royal family, um, you've got to be really careful about what you're saying. You've got to be absolutely honest. I'm in my X number of years of working in PR. I've never lied to a journalist once, hand on heart. If you can't say something or you can't guide, then I'm afraid you've just got to say that. You've got to be absolutely upfront and honest. Um, I've never briefed against another member of the royal family to promote my own member of the royal family. Again, that would be something that the Queen would have never sanctioned. Um, so, you, you know, quite a lot of stories, if, if you can't say something on the record, then you can guide and say, actually, if you wrote that in the paper tomorrow, um, you're going to look ridiculous because it's absolutely not true. Um, and again, also... It's, you know, it, there are, there are stories, official stories. There's also stories that the media love, which are also the personal about you know, boyfriends and girlfriends, which you know, obviously members of the royal family don't want to talk about. And if you set a precedent about either knocking a story down or confirming a story that's actually personal, then there's very little of, sort of, of, of getting, you know, getting that back again. Um, so what you don't want to do is set a, a difficult and awkward precedent going forward. You mentioned the Queen would never sanction briefing against other people. And, and I think, yeah. you know, let's get the kind of elephant in the room out, out of the room because we know that's been a, a topic of conversation re recently with with Harry and Meghan. Um, so if another member of the royal family had done that, would the Queen have dealt with that as an internal issue in terms of, um, you know, challenging them around that or, or, or spoken to them about well, that? Well, as I said, I, yeah, it's a really difficult... It's never, it never happened on my watch. Um, and I've never seen anyone else do it. Mm. Whether that happened in the past before I joined the household, I don't know. Um, also, yeah, but maybe the Queen didn't know about it. Mm. If it did happen, you know, I can't say hand on heart 
that you know, Duke of Sussex is, is wrong because I, I don't know what happened pr prior to my time yeah. or whether the Queen knew about it at all. But all I can say is it never happened when I was there. Mm. So the royal family's gone through a huge, I suppose, challenge in the last 20 years, isn't it, really? I mean, you know, we've had lots of different stories. They're, they're a family like any other family. and People sometimes forget that and therefore, yes. you know, pay, people, relationships break up. There's problem children. There's all sorts of stuff. How do you keep that balance, though, around um, all the good work they do as well? By promoting that good work, um, by drawing a light onto you know, a charitable cause that wouldn't necessarily get any, any publicity if it wasn't because of their royal patron or a royal visit. Um, you know, I keep hearing the phrase, keep calm and carry on. And that's very much the mantra of the royal family. Um, but it's difficult. You know, I've had members of the royal family come into my office in tears because there's been something awful in a newspaper about them, which is blatantly untrue. Um, but there is one fact in it which is correct. So if you go back and challenge, you're going to have to challenge or rebut all of it, which sometimes is it, you just can't do it because, again, it sets a precedent. But it's awful seeing a member of the royal family in tears. Mm. And then the next day they're out doing an engagement with a, probably the same journalist who's just written this, this story, mm. reporting on it. And you can see that probably, you know, really upsets them. Rightly so, it upset me. So when you hear the, when you hear the story that <clears throat> the royal family's policy is, you know, never complain, never explain, that, that, that can't be 100% you know, of a policy because clearly they had people like you to, to sort of Absolutely. do that in some respect. And we had some very, very good lawyers who we employed um, to give us proper legal advice. But, you, you, I mean, you look at the phone hacking, Philip, whenever that was, 2003, 2004, um, you know, there were very mem many members of the royal family and members of the royal household who actually got compensation for getting hacked. I was one of them. I was hacked. I, I got some compensation. Um, and that because, you know, we challenged this. So yeah, I would absolutely, when something needs to be challenged, the, the, the royal household not scared to stand up and be countered. Mm. So let's kind of move away from just talking about the royal family and talk about the role and, and, and this kind of skill set that you need there, because I think we can get consumed if we're not careful with the mystique of the royal family. And I think somewhat, sometimes, you know, it's important to keep that mystique. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you started some years ago, you, you've worked within government, you've worked obviously for... Not that many years ago, please. No, well, no, I mean, you know, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're talking, we're talking decades, but not, you know, not many decades, but, <laughs> but you know, we're talking a number of years and, and certainly pr probably what the, you know, sort of beginning when you started with um, the mobile phones weren't necessarily a big thing that's correct yeah and, and absolutely. so we I remember that like a brick in my handbag yeah and so we've moved from that era to this era throughout all those different key roles you've worked in how has the role changed how has your job changed I think you have to be far more fleet of foot now I mean in my day you know, people used to send out press notices I mean that's absolutely archaic now um so more feet of foot. I think also trying to think, I hate the phrase, but you know, thinking outside the box far more now because you've got everyone that can be a journalist. Everyone can work in PR. You know, you've got bloggers, you've got influencers, you've got TikTok, you know, Twitter, Instagram. You know, I'm sure like, you know, I'm on all of them. I'm completely obsessed. I don't know how I feed my children because I'm too busy looking at my phone. Um, so you've got much more coming at you as a, as a PR person. I also think you've got to be more robust in whether you respond and whether you don't. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. My last job was working for the Archbishop of Canterbury, the um, leader of the Church of England um, here. He is very much a social media buff. He saw something on Twitter, which he hated. It was absolutely, it was incorrect. He said, right, Ailsa, we need to rebut this. Put something out in my name to rebut it. And I said to him, absolutely, we can. But this person's got three followers. You've got thousands. If we go and put something out in your name and rebut it, we're drawing attention to a story which is getting no traction at all. No one's, no one's even seen it. So I think you've got to be confident in your judgment and your abilities to actually sometimes do nothing rather than do something. 
And that's one of the beauties, isn't it, of social media sometimes, actually, is you can you can instantaneously see the circulation of that individual or that whatever group, yeah, et cetera, absolutely. and make that absolutely. judgment, um, which you can't always with a blog or something else. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But you know, so, social media can be so toxic, and we've all seen it. And, like, you know, I worry about kids now and what they see on social media and what they do and, you know, and how they're being groomed. You know, especially, you know, my daughter's 13, and I worry horribly about what she sees on, you know, on social media. Mm. But it's, but it's, 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 it's that double edged sword, isn't it? Because we kind of can't live without it anymore. And, and certainly, certainly from a comms person, you know, it's probably an invaluable tool because you can get an instant message out there about something yeah. and rebut Absolutely. things and rebut things. And you get, you get, of course, instantaneously the third party endorsements. Yeah. So you know, you, you're you putting something out there and then you're getting big names, either liking or, or you know, adding their own positive comment. And you know, it's win, win, win. Mm-hmm. So what are the skills? Then? Tell me what the skills are. If someone was listening and thinking, do you know what? I, you know, being a, a communications in, in that world, I'd love to do that. For, what, what sort of skill set do you need? Um, you need resilience, I would say, absolutely. Um, enjoying working with people. You know, I'm a huge people person. It's all about relationships. There have been so many times, Philip, in the past where a journalist who I know has come to me and said, we've got this great story. And I've said to them, look, don't run it now. But if you can leave it for two weeks, I will give you something better um, as a story. And they've done that. And it's worked in both both our f- favours. So resilient, uh, I think you need um, good, excellent judgment always. I think you also you need to be not afraid to make a mistake. And that often is, you know, you've got someone who's got watched your back. And I know as a as a you know, as a manager, as a leader. I've always said to my team, I'm happy for you to make mistakes and I will always have your back because basically the buck stops with you. Mm. So you've got to let people make mistakes. Yeah. Um, small ones, I hope. But yeah. I think you just, you know, they've got to, they've, they've, they've got to try. Uh, n- never take credit for something that you haven't done. And I've worked, I'm sure you have, I've worked with many people who do that and it's just not, you can't be a leader if you do something like that. Yeah. Um, and you need a, a thick skin. Yeah. Yeah. There have been many times, I remember back in the news of the world days, where you'd have journalists screaming at you at, you know, at midnight on a Friday night or a Saturday night before the, you know, the Sunday newspaper come out with something awful. Uh, so you've got to have a thick skin. You know, don't take it personally. And so when we look at... Um... When we look at the, the world of a comms person now, I'll give you some example of where I'm going with this. I, I've looked at a few um, press releases recently of some, some you know, globally renowned people. And what struck me about them was a degree of naivety around the security yeah. issues that actually they were compromising by what they were doing. So you know, in order to get publicity, we're going to expose X, Y, and Z in terms of, you know, we're, we're revealing where someone lives. We're going to be revealing, you know, personal possessions of value we're going to be doing all those sorts of things where from a security perspective i look at it and i think that piece of pr you've just done has actually created a vulnerability within your client is that something that would normally be something you would be thinking about or is that is that a new thing no no absolutely what we'd be thinking about so i worked on a number of documentaries when i worked in the royal household um, you know, often a, a team would follow the royal family around for a year. We would always view the footage before it was broadcast to see whether there were any security implications. You know, if they'd filmed one of the private apartments of Buckingham Palace, um, which would lead to a vulnerability. Mm. Um, so yes, absolutely, the, the forefront of anything like that. Mm. You know, often there'll be things that you are, is out of your control, but while you've you've got a film crew or photographer inside your parameters you can call the shots far more easily mm. so yes absolutely yeah because i mean I, I it seems to me that in the modern world when we we see comms people working with high profile individuals and increasingly mm. um you know let's call it what it is celebrities will have a comms person or a pr agent or something yeah um and the way i look at it from one is that they're not looking at it from a security perspective they're looking at it purely from a publicity perspective 
But I can't, I don't think when you're a comms person that, you know, it's just so insular as that. You've got to think about the policy implications, the security implications, uh, so much more than just what the message is. And certainly you know, when we used to do recce for overseas tours, a member of our family would, would come on, you'd have the private secretary on the recce, who obviously is the lead policy person. You'd have the comms director and you'd have the lead um, protection officer. So, and we would all talk about other people's remits and work. So I would might have a question about security. The police officer might have a question about PR. Mm. You know, we're working as a team because nothing is in isolation. Well, did you do that before you went to, to uh, the Royal House? Or did you do that when you were in government, for instance? It was very, well, the minister, secretary of state that I worked for didn't have police protection. So it would be, it would be a private secretary and a, and a press officer. Yeah. But would you still be thinking about security issues around that? That's a good, that's a really good question. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Because I don't think a, a, a minister of state or a secretary of state would probably have those sort of security, high profile security issues than you would have you know, a member of the royal family or, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many government ministers I can name now. Can yeah. you? Well, no, but interesting. When I used to work, when I worked in parliament, I used to say to politicians, the next time you're doing a, um, a piece of the TV, can you, can you, A, not do it outside your home? And B, yeah. when they put where you live, can you just put the county rather than the actual village you're living in? Because you're, yeah. you're actually leaking information that people don't need to know about. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, you know, you became very, uh, very uh, uh, conscious of those security issues when you moved into the royal household because, because of the very nature of the role you do. Yeah. Um, but it's understandable that other comms people that work in the corporate sector or work in private family offices potentially yeah. or other places, you know, may not necessarily understand that or factor it in because that's not the experience they've had. Yeah. I remember I remember an unnamed member of the royal family going overseas, going on private holiday overseas and posting a photograph on some media channel. And I rung them. I said, you're being ridiculous. So everyone knows, A, you're not at your home. So that is vulnerable. And also they know where you are and, you, and you've got your kids there as well. So don't think, you know, this stuff can't be shared. And also once you're on a social media footprint, it, it never evaporates. It's there for life. Yeah, and, we, and, and we've seen did, that. They did it out of innocence. It yeah. was not, you know, nothing you know, deliberate or sinister. It was out of innocence. Yeah. Well, we've seen that with footballers, haven't they? And then the house get burgled straight away. So, you know, that's a kind of basic piece of advice nowadays. And that, that's, you know, yeah. with PR teams and what have you. So what's what's the kind of commonalities then in terms of working for these three separate high-profile roles? Uh, and I'm sure you I know you worked in other ones, but particularly with those high. What were the, what were the common denominators? I think whatever you <coughs> – the, the joy of being a comms director is that you're always behind the scenes. You can't do the story. But, of course, anything you say or do or act on – you're doing it on behalf of your principal. So you don't want to let yourself down, but most importantly, you don't want to let them down. Yeah. So you've just got to be really, really careful about what you say. And I say to you know journalists that I deal with, I say, you know, I will give you, I'll help you off the record. But if you if you cross me, that's it. That's the end of the trust for our relationship. Mm. Um and I'm very happy to start with trust, but if it goes if it goes south, that's it. That's it for Nito. And do you find that you you in the roles you had that you end up kind of caring for the person you're yeah, representing totally absolutely because you're spending a lot of time with them you know you're spending downtime with them um so you, you are you're like you, you're, you're like a, a wife or a mother or a you know a social worker absolutely and they will you know, i remember that i'm sure the countess of wessex won't mind me saying but when i went on maternity leave with my son she was sending me emails. They sent gifts. I mean, you just say, "How? What a lovely thing that is!" Mm. You know, she was, a, you know, she was a mother the year before, so she was actually offering, you know, advice. I mean, how kind is that? Um, I remember again with the Archbishop of Canterbury, a ghastly story, well, upsetting story about him and his father, which transpired that the father he thought he had wasn't. He was the, the bastard child of Winston Churchill's private secretary, uh, Anthony Montague Brown. And that played out in the Daily Telegraph, you know, front page, it lasted for a week. Actually, the Archbishop came up really, really well. 
But it was upsetting for him because it obviously proved that his mother had had an affair while she was also working for Churchill, um, that he was a bastard. So you're having your own personal life played out in the national media. Mm. So you do, you act as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a shoulder, you know, you, and you take their pain into yourself as well. Mm. And I think that's something that people don't realise, isn't it? Is is when you when you're involved in those environments, you're know, working closely with those individuals. You know, you you get to know them behind the scenes, get behind the, the yeah. real person, not the kind of public profile. Absolutely, and you have personal buy-in. You have personal buy-in, which makes you want to go the extra mile. Mm. And you understand if they're you know, they're human. If they're a bit grumpy one day, or don't want to listen to advice, or just want to read their papers. That's absolutely fine. They may be you know, in the public eye uh, and celebrities, but they're also human beings, you know, and every human being has their flaws. Mm -hmm. And so what are the lessons? What are the lessons? If you, if you were going to write a book about, about being a comms person um, based on all the, all the experience you have in terms of the various places you've worked and the different environments, you know, government to the royal family, yeah. to the head of the Anglican church, what, what, what would the lessons be that you draw out of that? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe in. Don't be afraid to push the boundaries. Don't be afraid to offer advice. Um, don't take it personally. Certainly don't take it personally. Um, and every chapter of your life is a, is a new beginning, but don't forget where you came from. So but the point you made there about, about um, to, you know, giving advice, because... It always, it always, it's one of these issues where they've employed you because you're an expert at what you do. Yeah. So they actually are seeking your advice. They may go about it a, a, a different way, but that's what you're there for, to give them the benefit of your experience and your advice. And so what they want is, they want that. They want, tell me what your views are on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but of course, everyone's a comms expert. I don't know whether you found that in, you know, in the army, in the police, but everyone, certainly with communications, everyone's an expert. So everyone's got an opinion about how communications work. And sometimes that can be quite exhausting when you've got someone who's never spoken to a journalist, um, never fronted a press conference, never has been on the end of it, just telling you how to do your job. Mm. Or someone who's developed a policy, they've been working on something for a year, and then the day before they want to announce it, they come and ask you what your view is. Could you do a comms plan? So, you know, you haven't been brought in right at the beginning. You're brought, brought in right at the end to basically mop up any any crap that, that spills out over it. Mm. Um, so I forgot. Sorry, I'm prattling on. I forgot what the beginning of the question was. So let's move to, the, other, the other thing that um, makes me think about the complexities of some of the roles you've done is the, the issue around culture. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and going into different environments in different countries and, and having to manage the different cultural nuances around what you're doing what you're saying you know how the royal family is seen in some places more and more recently with the you know the kind of rep, you know reparation around slavery and all these other issues yeah. i think you've got to be very attuned to the environment you're going in and actually more recently i found that traveling with the archbishop of canterbury so he there's a president there's an anglican christian presence in 42 countries worldwide so the policies, for example, in North America, where, which is quite liberal, are going to be incredibly different to that in Uganda or Nigeria, where they're you know, ultra conservative. So you've really you've got to you've got to read the lay of the land, and you've got to nuancing your message to fit where you are. And does that mean that you have to do that research as well? Do you have to understand that yourself? Yeah, but also you will have people on the ground, whether it's the royal family or whether it is you know, the church. You have people on the ground who are the real experts. So you draw on your resources. Mm. Um, in every royal visit, it's not the royal household that takes the lead. It's the either the high commissioner or the um, uh, yeah, attorney general or you know, whoever is, is on the ground. They're the ones that are living and breathing this every day. So they are much more attuned to what is going on than we would be in our, you know, in our palace in, in London. Mm. So you draw on the resources available. Mm. So, I, I mean... When I look at the royal family more recently, though, and I know we keep drifting back to that subject, I look at some of the things that have gone on, and I think, and, I, and I'm not going to ask you, but I'm not going to put you on the spot because I think that would be unfair and indiscreet. But you know, I, I, since you've moved on, there, there clearly, I think, been a few bloopers in terms of, let's say, putting certain people forward for interviews that they probably shouldn't have done, or 
you know, I, I think of William and Kate more recently when they were in the Caribbean and they were seen mm-hmm. to be shaking hands. What you know, and it, the appearance was it was through this fence and it almost, if, you know, and again, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know how much control they had on that, but these are all factors that get played out. And so sometimes it must be a little bit about crisis management as well around yeah. some things happened. You you can't control what the narrative now. So what do you do then? What you do is look at the next step, something you can't control at the moment. So what are we going to do next to actually uh, mitigate what has happened previously and whether that is um, ensuring a photo call like that doesn't happen anymore, putting out a statement immediately, sitting down and doing an interview, doing a, uh, arranging a picture caption, which actually sort of knocks the other one out of the water. Um, I remember Alistair Campbell saying to me, if a story lasts longer than 10 days, then you basically better resign. Right. So what you don't want is a story that continues and gathers momentum after 10 days. So you've got to be thinking on your feet and I guess have some degree of creativity around that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And also it, it goes back again to relationships. Yeah, sometimes it's going to be out of your control. I know exactly the story you talked about. It was uh, Johnny Diamond from the BBC broke it. Um, and then it just gathered momentum and gathered momentum. Um, and apparently there was you know, quite an inexperienced um, group of people on the sort of home team working for that, which is no fault of their own. And of course, that that whole trip was arranged by you know, the, the host country. So the host country wanted them to do all of this. Mm. And of course, again, going back to you know, drawing on your, your resources, presumably the royal household said, you know, thank you very much. If you think this is a good idea, then of course, you know, to, to placate them and, mm. and promote what they wanted to promote, they agreed. Mm-hmm. There's never, as you know, there is never one side to any story. Mm. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a complicated jigsaw, isn't it, of... of... Yeah of different pieces in terms of, you know, as we've talked about the comms role and then factoring in the security issues around, <clears throat> you know, the exposure and, and we, you know, it's, it's really interesting how the King has right from the word go has made a real point of being somebody who wants to engage with the crowd and, and walk up and have those walk and talks. But we've also seen. But, the, of course, the, but of course, you know, the queen was the one who introduced the walkabout. So before the you know, Queen Elizabeth, the walkabout did not exist. Well, my point, I guess, is is when he's been doing it recently, there's been security issues regularly. I mean, it's talking about eggs being thrown, but that's that, that yeah. demonstrates a vulnerability in those, which maybe because of the Queen's reputation and the way she was seen, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's because we've had a change of monarch and therefore people re, you know, reassess their own views on the monarchy. But yeah. but having to balance that, that again, that, that issue with the comms team wanting to say, get out there and talk and do that. And the security saying, yeah, but hang on a minute, we've got these issues, got it. But ultimately the decision maker is the king. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I've had, you know, I've had those conversations with security people where I want the principals to, you know, to go out and shake the hands and speak to the kids and speak to the, you know, the disabled and you know, speak to everybody. And we've been told, actually, you, you know, you can't do that. So, and I'm only interested in the, in the photo op and you know, and something that look, appears relevant and then very warm. So there's there can be friction, mm. you know, I, you know, And sometimes there's no easy path to get what I want, which the security people will be happy with. Mm. Um, you know, it's so, so sometimes you have to compromise, or sometimes you you, you lose, mm. but you might lose that day and win the next. But I, I know from my own experience when I was. Um... A, uh, a secco in the place, a security coordinator, and, and doing rule uh-huh. events and what have you. And and you know the, the the bottom line was, whatever the security risk, you're going to have to manage it because they are not going to cancel. Yeah. And so between you and the comms team, you're going to have to come up with a plan yeah. that that facilitates them doing what they want to do in a safe environment. And so I've know I've worked with the comms team in the in the in the royal household where. You know, we've had to come up with last minute arrangements and, you know, brief in and brief out around why we're going to be doing certain things because there is yeah. a security risk. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and I know half the security people I work for would rather, there were never any media or any public on, <laughs> on events, which sort of rather defeats the object because then you wouldn't have a monarchy. But uh, it's interesting, it, it reminds me of doing um, a trip to, to Northern Ireland with the Queen and Prince Philip, is when she met Martin McGuinness. So it was all very, very last minute. Um, 
it was in a, a library, I think, in Belfast, and we wrecked it, just three of us, sort of in the dead of night, um, to have a look. And it was sort of a, a, a gallery. There were people who were exhibiting paintings, and Martin McGuinness was going to be there. And then there was going to be a lineup at the end. Of course, we couldn't tell anybody. And I had to, in the morning, just tell a, a cameraman and a photographer to come with me and be worth their while. And they were sort of like, well, yeah, whatever. And this, of course, extraordinary, extraordinary historic event happened. And the Queen and Prince Philip shook Martin McGuinness's hand at the end. Um, and that's where, you know, security and comms, you had to work together um, you know, really, really closely and trust each other to ensure that actually that historic event was going to come off. And it was an incredible event. I didn't sleep that much. No, I, don't, I can imagine, but it was an incredible event. And I think... You know, equally, I remember going back a bit in time when the Queen, I think, first went to the to the south of Ireland. Yeah, and I think she went to a was it a, a sporting event as well there. She did. I was on that visit. It was absolutely amazing. It was one of those visits where it could go either way, and I just felt from the moment she got off the aircraft, you know, wearing green, it just very, very, very gathered, you know, incredibly gathered momentum. You know, and there were people protesting in the streets before she arrived. And there was obviously people incredibly anxious, you know, including the Queen and, and Prince Philip, you know, to make it go right. Because everything they did, everything they wore, everything they said, every expression they made was being scrutinised. So it had to be faultless. And in my opinion, that visit was absolutely faultless. Yeah. And the last day when, when they did a walkabout in County, County Cork around a farmer's market, and it was like seeing the queen you know as beyonce it was like they were like, they were like rock stars you know people could not get enough yeah. it was it was spine thing it's one of those visits where you think you you are part of history yeah so so drawing to a close then what's next for you what, what, what's happening with you now uh, i gotta walk the dog in a minute <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question so i've had so i'm working for abc as their all one of their raw commentators at the moment but I really enjoy working for an individual or an organisation that I have that I have buy-in with that I can really I feel that I can make a difference, um, and that you know I can give I can give. So that, God willing, will be my my next step. So if any of your listeners are out there and think I'm I'm the person for you, get in touch with Philip. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll definitely um, your details will all be attached. So you know, in terms of your professional uh, contact details, so. Um, if anyone's out there looking for a uh, comms director, then you're definitely the person to to speak with. Just go back to the ABC role. How interested are the Americans still in what happens over here? That's a, again a very good question. I think incredibly. Um, you know, I talked about Harry and Meghan on on ABC just before Christmas. I think there is still a fascination with with the monarchy because it's something they don't have, and everyone's interested in something that you don't have. Um, you know, I think we are, the Queen was the most famous woman in the world. Um, and you know, we do things differently, we speak differently. Um, and of course, there's that special relationship with the state still. So I do think, I do think there's still a fascination. Whether that will continue, you know, who knows? Mm. But um, I feel very confident in the future of the monarchy and how King Charles will progress it. And I think there are good things to come. And I think we need them in time. You know, we've got we've got war, we've got famine. You know, we're worried about feeding and educating our children. You know, we need we need some help. And I think the monarchy can do that. And we'll, I mean, presumably you're going to be working for ABC then during the coronation. Yes, I am. So have you already started those sort of plans around that? They have. Um, we will obviously be brought in on the day. Um, but yes, but you know, Plans, as you know, have been going on for years and years and years. And I, uh, you know, I know the Prince of Wales, as was when the Queen was still alive, was was looking at you know sort of coronation plans. But it's going to be very different, as you know. You know, in in 1953, you know, there were no women bishops. Of course, there are now. You know, the Commonwealth was and the realms were much bigger. You know, we were a part of multicultural. You know, multi-ethnic you know, society now so we are going to have to reflect in in may's coronation a much different society and culture that was you know 71 years ago interesting 
Well, listen, it's been fascinating, and I know that our listeners will be fascinated to listen to not just about the royal family and all your your anecdotes there and that kind of, that, I suppose, slightly secret world that we all read about and, and watch, and some of us have been privileged to have a snapshot into. But, you know, on the wider subjects of, of PR and, and communications and crisis management. So, you know, Ulster, thank you so much. It's been an absolute oh, pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy your walk with your dog. Don't get too wet, hopefully, because it's pouring a rain here. <laughs> And um, I look forward to seeing you at lunch very soon. Me too, Pip. Thank you very much. It's been a real joy. You've been brilliant. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.